on medical eligibility. Um, we've received many questions regarding the uh, medical history or pre-existing health conditions. Are there any health um, conditions that would exclude children from being eligible for vaccination? Can I direct that to Prof Toon, please? Yeah, I think as uh, Dr. Wycliffe have uh, already alluded to, certainly if uh, your child has a severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis to any of the components of the vaccine, um, those are clear contraindications or basically uh, conditions that would render them ineligible. Um, certainly, uh, certain patients with um, certain conditions that may affect their ability to mount a response um, may be sort of uh, relooked at in terms of whether or not it is the correct timing to get the vaccine. Perhaps we can move on to the next question about Kawasaki disease. Uh, uh, Dr. Chan, could you take that, please? whether or not uh, their children with a history of Kawasaki disease, whether they can take the vaccine. So, uh, um, I think this kind of leads on to what uh, Dr. Toon was talking about, which is that uh, there is really no specific health condition in which the child shouldn't take the vaccine. Uh, for Kawasaki's disease, uh, when we look at the cases of myocarditis or pericarditis, which is a rare complication of the COVID vaccine, um, there wasn't any signal from those cases to say that those people already had pre-existing uh, Kawasaki's disease or pre-existing heart issues. So um, I don't think the history of Kawasaki's disease is going to be a risk factor for you to um, have any kind of complication from the COVID vaccine subsequently. I mean, that's what it looks like from all the cases um, globally as well as locally. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Um, we've also have uh, questions from parents of special needs children asking if the vaccination is safe for them, like a special needs boy with ADHD. Would you uh, answer that as well, please, Dr. Chan? Thank you. Yeah, so actually, when I look at uh, all the questions, uh, the next two questions on this slide, as well as all the questions that are coming in through live q &A, I think there are a lot of questions on multiple uh, medical conditions, right? So there's things like not just the KD issue, but also special needs with ADHD, um, underweight children, G6PD, allergy, so food allergy, dust allergy, egg allergy, um, asthma, um, eczema, uh, certain genetic syndromes like Down syndrome, Noonan syndrome. So all these medical conditions are a problem uh, for taking the vaccine, all right? Um, in fact, some of these conditions may make your child more immunocompromised, and therefore, if they were to get COVID infection, they may actually suffer a more severe illness because of their medical condition, and therefore, all the more important that they are vaccinated. Um, as uh, Dr. Thun had already mentioned, the ones who really cannot have the COVID vaccine are the ones who've already had some kind of allergic reaction to one of the components in the vaccine or an allergic reaction to the first dose, right? So if you get your first dose and you have a severe allergic reaction like anaphylaxis with difficulty breathing, you get a rash in the first few hours, you get facial swelling in the first few hours, then these are the ones who we would say are allergic and should not have further doses. Um, but general basic medical conditions are generally safe for the vaccine. And if you're uncertain, it is worth discussing it with your specialist, looking after your child um, for that condition and uh, discussing it with them. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Um, so Prof Toon, could you take the next question please about uh, children who have recovered from COVID? Um, will they be eligible for the vaccination or, or how long should they wait for? Prof Toon, please. Apologize for dropping out just now. Um, yeah, coming back to this, uh, we do know that uh, even for persons who have had COVID infection, their immune response may not be complete. And, uh, and in many of them, actually giving them a vaccine actually boosts their immune response to further uh, protect them against reinfection. Um, they will be eligible. Um, the ministry will provide guidelines for the timing as well as the interval. Um, but in the adolescents and adults, we have generally used a conservative time frame of about three months uh, from the time of the infection to getting the vaccine. So um, I do expect that the ministry will provide such guidance uh, uh, already. DDMS, would you like to add to that? Yeah, yeah just to add to that, uh, indeed, uh, we will be following the same guidance as for adults. Right? So as uh, 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 
uh, Prof Kun has mentioned, right, after recovery, right, um, the, they are typically quite well protected right, for, for about three months at least. Right, and uh, that's the time when the uh, protective cells will tend to mature and differentiate. So after three months, if you give an additional boost, this will give uh, this will add to the protection. But it is a I think analogy used by my minister is a, a way of training the immune system. So even after the immune system has uh, been uh, trained to recognize the virus based on the infection, but after three months, if you give another boost, another uh, not boost but another uh, uh, dose of the vaccine, but it will uh, further train the immune system and give uh, longer term and better protection. So the recommendation will be the same that after they recover, we recommend that at around three months uh, after recovery that they should get an additional dose. Uh, that is uh, assuming that they have not been previously vaccinated. Thank you, DDMS.